Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Yemen marks 20 years of fragile unity. Sudan and Chad join forces to fight rebels. And on the third anniversary of Camp Destruction, Palestinians protest displacement. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh called on all Yemeni parties, both inside and outside Yemen, to hold a national dialogue on the agreement signed on February 2009. In his speech on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of unity, the Yemeni president welcomed the formation of a united national government composed of political parties that are fully represented in the parliament, on top of which is what he described as the basic partner for unity in reference to the Yemen Socialist Party. Saleh also ordered the release of all detainees captured during the Saada War and some detainees from the southern insurgencies. The homeland belongs to all of us and is big enough for everyone. We welcome national partnerships with all political forces in light of the Constitution and law and what everyone agrees on. In light of the results of the dialogue, a government could be formed with all influential political forces represented in the parliament, especially the basic partner for achieving unity. And our partners defend it with the aim of holding parliamentary elections on its scheduled date. In light of the constitutional legitimacy and political pluralism, this reflects our keenness to turn over a new page and eliminate the impacts of the 1993 crisis and the 1994 summer war. Coinciding with the 20th anniversary of unity between the north and the south of Yemen, Yemeni authorities launched a campaign to support this unity and confront what it described as the separatist trend in southern Yemen. Local authorities set up signposts and boards on major roads in southern cities, including Aden, calling for unity and deploring the separatist mentality. Joining me from Sana'a is Al Jazeera correspondent Ahmed Shalafi. Ahmed, what is the most prominent point in the Yemeni president's speech? First, I want to reiterate that many political observers I talked to a few days ago believe that the Yemeni president's speech would not hold any surprises, but it countered these expectations and raised hope on many issues. But, of course, we can look at the speech from two angles. First, it is a speech about forming a united national government, which is obviously about the opposition parties. He talked about forming one national government and said that it could be formed. Of course, until now, there haven't been any new talks from the opposition position on this matter, but in the past it had expressed that it wants to have a wide-ranging national dialogue to discuss all the political, economic and social problems and issues, both in the south and the north and in all of Yemen's political regions. This is about the Yemeni president's calling for the formation of a united national government. He also called for the release of all the detainees of the Saada War. The Yemeni president wanted to reaffirm what was agreed upon, which is that war will not return, because there has been some speculation lately that there will be a seventh war between the Houthis and the Yemeni army. When it comes to the Houthis, by releasing their detainees, the Yemeni president showed his good intentions. In addition, he ordered the release of some detainees in southern insurgent regions, such as Al-Dalia, Ebian, and Lakhju. So some of these were not expressed in the Yemeni president's speech. Many political observers that we talked to believe that this may bring back in the future some of the movements to Yemen's political scene. The representative of the Arab League in Iraq, Naji Shalgam, affirmed that the League treats all parties equally. He added that Iraq has the right to request that the Arab League mediate between the political parties in order to form a national government that allows everyone's participation without marginalizing anyone. Iraq has the right to request that we monitor, advise, and provide suggestions to all the political blocs and delegations. 
We encourage them to express their opinions, and we should mediate between them, seek common grounds and resolve the disputes that take place from time to time, in order to speed up the progress in the formation of the national government, in which all political blocs can participate, without any exceptions or the marginalization of any party. I want to reiterate to those who have doubts about the Arab League's position that the Arab League insists on absolutely treating all parties equally. Even though the manual recount in Baghdad confirmed the triumph of al Iraqiya in the elections, the stagnant political scene has not changed. Tariq Mahir has a report on this political scene. In Iraq's current political turmoil, no one wants to compromise. The anticipated meeting between the two rival blocs competing for the leadership of the government, al-Maliki and Alawi, faces an unknown fate. The current delay of the meeting, whether it is deliberate or not, seems to have no end despite the affirmation from both sides that they would initiate that meeting. But rumor has it that the reason for this delay is exactly what the politicians believe it to be. We are surprised that the state of law placed conditions for convening this meeting, as if it is a gift from them to al-Iraqiyya. This is unacceptable to us. We are meeting in the interest of the people, and we don't need any preconditions for this meeting. We didn't place any conditions, and we don't expect others to place conditions on us. Meanwhile, despite two consecutive meetings, the Iraqi National Alliance and the state of law have not succeeded in reaching an agreement on a candidate for the next prime minister. There are more disputes than agreements over the list of candidates, which includes Ibrahim al-Jafari, Bakir Zubaidi, and Adel Abdul Mehdi, Maliki's competitors for the leadership of the government. During the last two or three days, there has been a discussion on some peripheral topics as well. One of the parties wanted to postpone it to have further discussion. We care about moving forward in this process, but we respect the will of the national political power that formed the essential alliance. After the results of the recount were announced, which did not change the makeup of the blocs, President Jalal Talabani tried to play the role of mediator. He gathered the political delegations for a lunch banquet, but the absences of Alawi and a number of Iraqi leaders were notable. There are no signs for a détente to the crisis. The only new development is the aggravation of the disputes. There is no hope for a consensus, especially when Alawi insists on being assigned to form the government, even though he has not gained the trust of the parliament. Meanwhile, Maliki reiterated that the leadership of the government is reserved for his coalition or the Iraqi National Alliance. In between these two major blocs, the other parties are voicing their demand for a compromise candidate. Tariq Mahir, Al Arabiya, Baghdad. Iraqi security forces carried out a series of preemptive military operations aimed at uprooting terror cells from the country. Five terrorists were killed and two were arrested, including the so-called Amir of Al-Qaeda's terror cell, during clashes southeast of Bakuba in the province of Diyala. Meanwhile, the Iraqi Department of Public Safety announced a security plan to protect health institutions in and around the Iraqi capital from terrorist attacks. A new achievement was added to the long list of achievements by Iraqi security forces in light of their latest operation, dubbed Lion's Leap, against terror networks. Iraqi security forces killed five terrorists and arrested two others, including the so-called Emir of Al-Qaeda's terrorist cell, during clashes that erupted in the village of Dainia, in the county of Baladruz, east of Bakuba. Security forces also seized three explosive belts and uncovered a cache of weapons and explosives. We carried out raids in the area of Bidul, including the villages of Salwa and Wahid Huzayran south of Baladruz. During the clashes that erupted between the courageous Iraqi security forces and the terrorists, five terror suspects were killed, namely the Amir of Al-Qaeda's terrorist cell, Salim Muftah Dahlaki, terror suspect Firas Hamza Ibrahim, terror suspect Ammar Abdullah Mahmoud, terror suspect Khalaf Alwan Mush'an, 
and the fifth terrorist who was not identified due to a lack of documents. Meanwhile, the Department of Public Safety in the Iraqi capital announced a security plan to protect health institutions from terrorist attacks. As part of the plan, the Department of Public Safety will increase police presence and security patrols in and around medical centers in the Iraqi capital. The plan aims to prevent possible terrorist attacks from targeting government institutions and their employees. We drafted a security plan to protect health and medical institutions and their employees from terrorist attacks. We want to keep a close eye on them so we can protect the lives of government employees and the general public. We instructed our units to remain vigilant at all times so they can respond quickly when summoned for help by hospitals or medics. Meanwhile, three bombs exploded in Baghdad, injuring nine Iraqi civilians. The first bomb exploded in the area of Ghadir, the second was set off inside El Baya parking lot, and the third was a sticky bomb that detonated in the area of Shab, injuring a motorist and damaging several nearby cars. Every now and then, the terrorists change tactics and criminal plots in an attempt to inflict the highest possible number of casualties among Iraqi civilians. In response, Iraqi security agencies launched preemptive strikes as part of an overall security strategy aimed at uprooting terror networks from the country. Mohammed Salam, Iraqia, Baghdad. Palestinian refugees demonstrated in front of the UNRWA headquarters in Beirut in rejection of the stalling in the reconstruction of the Nahar al-Barad camp. They also announced a three-day strike. In protest of the unjustified stalling of the reconstruction of the Nahar al-Barad camp, and in light of the hardship of its displaced, different Palestinian factions, the Commission for Nahar al-Barad residents, and a number of refugees organized a demonstration in front of the UNRWA headquarters in Bir Hassan. They carried signs explaining their hardships and asking for their deprived rights. They asked the UNRWA to assume its responsibilities and hasten their return to the camp. We are guests. In God's names, we won't exchange Palestine's soil for anything except for heaven's soil. Listen and believe. We don't want anything from you. We don't want your sympathy. Only give us our freedom to live in dignity until God returns us to Palestine. Now is the time to end this tragedy by speeding up the reconstruction of this camp and by providing the necessary funds to reconstruct it the way it was. From here, in the name of the residents of the Nahr al-Barid camp and the residents of all refugees in Lebanon and the world, we call in hastening UNARWA's work and on foreign and Arab donor countries to provide the necessary funds to end this tragedy. There are no excuses for this delinquency and delay because it mirrors the continuous siege and we reject it. We want the residents of the camp to return and everyone who is dear to us and honorable rejects this humiliation. The Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, DFLP, held a political festival in the Nahr al-Barid camp to mark the third anniversary of the camp's Nakba and the 62nd anniversary of Palestine's Nakba which included a march in the camp's main streets. Many spoke in favor of the refugees holding on to their right to go back to their homes in Palestine and equated citizenship plans to displacement. After three years of this Nakba, this tragedy, we have the right, we, the residents of the camp, to demand accountability. We ask all those involved, all those responsible for our hardship to come and show us what you gave the residents of this camp for beginning their fourth year in this tragedy. They also called on Arab countries to put an end to the suffering of the residents in the camp by providing the necessary funds to rebuild their destroyed homes.
In other news, arrested following the abduction of IB, ID, IDF soldier Gilad Shalit, top Hamas commander Mohammed Abu Tir was released today from an Israeli prison after completing a four-year sentence for association with a terrorist group. Activists working to secure Shalit's freedom dismissed Abu Tir's release as absurd. We get more in this report. After his release from Nafka prison, Mohammed Abu Tir received a festive and warm welcome from family and friends in the village of Subahar, adjacent to Jerusalem. He told reporters that he has paid a hefty price for being born a political man, but that now he is happy. The 59-year-old spent an accumulated 25 years in Israeli jails on terrorism-related charges, including a seven-year stint after attempting to poison Israel's water supply while the head of the Hamas military wing is a Dean al Qassam brigades. He was then recruited by current Gaza Prime Minister Ismail Haniya and appointed number two on the Hamas political list during the 2006 Palestinian parliamentary elections. Abu Tir, who has publicly stated that he dyes his beard bright orange, as it was the practice of the Prophet Muhammad, today told reporters that he is sorry that Gilad Shalit remains in captivity because no one, himself included, enjoys captivity. He then firmly placed blame for the collapse of a prisoner exchange deal for Shalit on the government of Israel. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. Speaking from Italy during a joint press conference with Italian Premier Silvio Berlusconi, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak cautioned Israel to avoid stalling tactics during peace talks with the PA. The 81-year-old Egyptian leader said doing so would result in an increase of terrorism not only in Arab and Middle Eastern countries, but all over the world. Israeli forces shot and killed two armed Palestinians during a gunfire near the Gaza Strip, southern border with Israel. An Israeli military spokeswoman said the two men were shot after they crossed the border and clashed with soldiers. She said the two gunmen entered near Nirim, a small farming community, after breaching the security fence along the border with the Palestinian enclave. Israeli media said soldiers ordered residents of the community to stay indoors during the gunfire. No group in the Gaza Strip claimed responsibility for the incident. A Palestinian official said medical teams were trying to get access to the site east of the town of Khan Yunis to recover the bodies. Earlier in the day, Israeli airstrikes targeted tunnels in the northern and southern Gaza Strip after Palestinians fired two rockets that landed in fields inside Israel. Chief of Russia's Federal Atomic Energy Agency, Sergei Kurdienko, said that Iran's nuclear power station that was built by Russia in Bushehr in southwest Iran will be operational by August. Kurdienko told reporters that the proposed UN Security Council sanctions against Iran will not affect the Bushehr nuclear energy reactor. The construction of Bushehr was officially completed last February. The three operational phases were tested, with the final stage set to be completed in the next three months. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and Speaker of the Kuwaiti National Assembly Jasmin al Khordafi met in Tehran to discuss the expansion and the fostering of their bilateral relations. al Khordafi said that Iran's decision to swap nuclear energy is a diplomatic move that will help curb some accusations against Tehran. During a joint press conference with the Iranian counterpart, Ali Larijani, Kuwait's parliament speaker, Jassim al Khordafi confirmed that his country's relationship with Iran is historical and strong. Ali Larijani also emphasized his country's interest in expanding relations with Kuwait. Ali Larijani also emphasized his country's interest in expanding relations with Kuwait. Following three days of meetings between the Speaker of the Kuwaiti National Assembly, Jassim al Karafi, and Iranian officials in Tehran, al Karafi and his delegation are now guests of Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. The meetings focused on fostering and expanding relations between the two countries. In recent years, Iran-Kuwait relations have witnessed notable improvement, mainly at the economic and political level. 
principles. In the past two years, the relations have witnessed an exceptional boost after the two countries signed a series of trade, economic, security and political agreements overseen by special joint committees. Iran and Kuwait stress the importance of fostering and expanding their bilateral relations as both neighbor countries are bound by historical and political ties. The two sides signed a parliamentary protocol which calls for joint political consultation in all domains, including bilateral and regional. The relations between the two countries have improved significantly over the past few years. al Kharafi's visit has great positive implications, reflecting the level of parliamentary cooperation and executive consultation between the two countries. We discussed ways to boost bilateral and regional cooperation. We share similar views on all these issues. Meanwhile, Kuwait expressed support for Iran's earlier announcement on its nuclear swap deal with the West as a way to alleviate strife and defuse the tension between the countries of the region. Both Tehran and Kuwait have expressed interest in boosting parliamentary cooperation, both at the Islamic and international levels. In addition, both countries described their bilateral relations as exemplary. It was an honest and clear dialogue and a renewed message to foster and boost relations between Iran and Kuwait. This is how some interpreted the parliamentary meeting in Tehran. This will also serve as a fortified wall to stop the spread of strife in the region. Radwan al-Hamruni, al-Alam, Tehran. The relationship between Sudan and Chad is as old as history itself. The two nations are geographically and economically linked, as they are bound by blood and mutual interests. Their historical relations are based on bilateral cooperation and consultation. The relationship between the two countries has recently witnessed a notable improvement in all domains. Both sides have come to an agreement to end the political and security hostilities along their border. For a long time, this conflict has strained relations between Khartoum and N'Djamena. The two countries have recently engaged in political and diplomatic efforts, which were crowned with the signing of a normalization agreement between Khartoum and N'Djamena. You are not welcome here, and we will not allow you to enter our territory or pass through our airspace. This is what the Chadian government told the head of Sudan's justice and equality movement, Khalil Ibrahim, upon landing at the Geneva airport without clearance from the Chadian government. This Chadian position against the justice and equality movement is due in part to the latest normalization agreement signed between Khartoum and N'Djamena. According to the accord, Sudan and Chad must not allow armed groups to use their territories to launch hostile actions against the country's border. The new accord has restored stability and security along the Sudanese Chadian border. In light of the accord, both countries' leaderships have pledged to boost bilateral cooperation at all levels, including political and diplomatic. We in Sudan are committed to maintaining good relations with our brothers in Chad. Chad's security is important to us. It's as important as Sudan's security. Past incidents have shown the security interdependence. What happens in Chad can affect, by and large, what happens in Sudan, and vice versa. We believe that our brotherly relationship is based on mutual interest. This is the basis of our cooperation. The relations between the two countries have recently witnessed notable improvement, which has led to a productive cooperation. Both sides launched practical measures to boost security cooperation, starting with the signing of a normalization protocol to secure their respective borders. As part of the implementation process, a joint Shadian Sudanese force was deployed along the border to protect national sovereignty and stop the infiltration of armed rebel groups into the countries. In addition, Khartoum pledged to supply electricity to more than 30 Chadian border villages battered by armed conflicts. The efforts exerted by the Chadian government have helped boost the peace process in the region of Darfur. In parallel, Khartoum launched efforts to unite Chad by offering to mediate talks between the opposition and N'Djamena. All these efforts have helped boost bilateral cooperation between Chad and Sudan. The two sides launched efforts to boost their relations based on a new set of principles aimed at serving both nations' interests. Sudan and Chad, which are geographically and historically linked, have pledged to foster and expand their bilateral cooperation, vowing to surpass their differences and open a new chapter in their relations.
Pakistan has blocked access to popular websites, YouTube and Facebook as part of a recent measure to counter websites containing sacrilegious materials. Press TV's Anil Sabir has more. Facebook, a networking website, has been indefinitely blocked in Pakistan for the website's attempt to hold a competition of drawing caricatures of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The blasphemous page has created a wave of outrage across the Muslim world, including Pakistan. Pakistan's largest religious party, the Jamaat Islami, on Wednesday held countrywide protests and meetings attended by ulama from all schools of thought, strongly lambasting and condemning the website. People of Pakistan is really very angry and they are feeling disgrace but the government is not according, uh, acting according to their uh, you know, emotions. So we are asking government and demanding uh, to close this Facebook and make a, a protest to the government who are making this sort of competition. Worldwide, the Muslim community had been calling for Muslims to boycott the popular social networking site. Representation of any prophet is deemed un-Islamic and blasphemous in Islam, let alone the caricature or cartoon of these divine personages. The Pakistani government had been severely criticized for not taking action sooner. The controversial website Facebook was still available for at least 24 hours after the ban on mobile phone devices like this. Early on Thursday morning, Pakistan's cellular industry also joined the blockade of Facebook, informing customers via text message of the website's suspension. Moments later, Pakistan also blocked the website YouTube, a popular video sharing site. The action was taken after authorities determined that some sacrilegious caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad were transferred from Facebook to YouTube. YouTube was also blocked in Pakistan back in 2007 for around a year for what it called un-Islamic videos. Pakistan uh, strongly condemns uh, the publication of blasphemous caricatures of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, on the social networking website Facebook. Such malicious and insulting attacks hurt the sentiments of Muslims around the world and cannot be accepted under the garb of freedom of expression. Blocking of the two websites could cut up to 25% of total internet traffic in Pakistan. However, Pakistanis believe that this is a negligible sacrifice to make in honor for their religion and holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Adil Sabah Press TV, Islamabad. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.